Okay, so this is just facts here at 9.30. 9.30 next week, we've actually saved a couple of our favorite parts for that. You're going to get some more of the heart at 9.30 next Sunday. This week, I just want to, at 9.30 this week, I just want to try to get you through a big overview. So um, uh, I put this picture up. This is my pre-trip picture, just to mention briefly that uh, there is a lot of work that goes into getting to Togo. That included finding a way to get our yellow fever vaccinations, doing various types of online safety training, getting insurance, those things. But then we... Uh, Here we are at LAX. You can tell we haven't just traveled 25 hours. We look way too happy uh, and put together, uh, ready to uh, get from there over on the left down to Togo down here. And uh, that means, first of all, destination Paris, France. So we flew a route pretty similar to the line that you see on there up to Paris. It's about 10 hours to... uh, Paris, and there, there we are, happily on the ground, maybe beginning to lose our minds a little bit. Uh, they t- it was cold. It was very cold, and they took us, we walked off the plane down onto the tarmac and onto a bus where they drove us through the innards of the Paris airport. Uh, so anyway, uh, then we had a very short turnaround until we flew from Paris down to Niamey, which is in Niger, and then they picked up a bunch of passengers there. We stayed on the plane, and they flew us on down to uh, Lome, which is the capital of, of Togo. So here's this very small and narrow country. Benin is there on the right of it, and Ghana is on the left. Ghana is a, was a British colony, so it's kind of English speaking. Togo is French colony, so it's French speaking. Um, Togo is little, but it has about 8 million people. And you can see the capital, Lome, down here, way down in the corner on the coast. Um, And this this is part of the coast of Africa that is most tragically famous for its slave trade. Um, Horrific, horrific things that went on there for a long time. Uh, so, uh, a couple pictures from our flight down. Uh, oops, sorry. There's Lomé. Um, uh, th- these guys were near me. Uh, and I just love the guy with his very colorful ma- eye mask and his glasses put on over them. Uh, and then this was my seatmate. He was a very, he's, a, he's conked out here, but he was a very friendly little guy who was very interested in me. Um, to his mother's chagrin, I think, but he thought I was great fun. Um, so we got to the airport in Lome. We, were, we did not know the, the Kendalls were going to meet us down there, so excited and surprised. That's Peyton, their oldest son. Um, and uh, then you've got to go through customs and immigration, and that lady on the left had been hired in advance to help us through customs and immigra- immigration, which was very helpful. Um, there's Dr. Kendall on the right, and uh, some bald guy over there, and then there's um, uh, that couple that you see in the middle. They just happened to be flying into the airport at the same time as us, and they were headed up to the hospital. Uh, he's in his uh, residency to be a family doctor, and she's a physical therapist, and so they were coming to help with the hospital for a month, so it was fun to, to get to know them. So then we headed over to a little... Uh, but it, we, we got there in the, around like 5 p.m., and you can't possibly drive at night on those roads, you know, to where we would need to go to the hospital. It would be, um, first of all, the potholes would make it impossible, but it, it would just be dangerous. So we had to spend the night there. So we stayed at a little hotelish thing. This picture is the next morning. You might think it was a very spiritual place. You see the name Leviticus there over the doorway, uh, but that was the name of the bar, actually, not... <laughs> Not the, not the hotel. Um, this is just this. This is what the street that the hotel is on. Uh, you see some kids playing down there. Um, uh, this this picture is actually from the end of our trip, but it's just a picture from the streets in Lome. They were having some kind of festival at the stadium. 
as we were driving by. I'm going to try to give you enough time to look at these for a moment or two before I go on. Um, you see all sorts of things on the freeways there that you wouldn't see here. Like this lady in front of us, we got a kick out of watching her try to keep her chickens in that bowl. They were determined to get out, and she was just as determined to keep them in. Um, so the, the freeways are quite a, quite a menagerie of things. Um, so here we are in, on the freeway in Lome, headed up toward the hospital. And, um, you know, to me and my ignorance, this looked poor. <laughs> I didn't realize until later that we were in the city, and this is actually pretty fancy. That's a huge house for Africa, um, but I didn't know that when I was first seeing it. Um, so here's an overall map of the country, again, that shows you where the hospital is uh, in relationship to the rest of the country. And I, I, don't, I, for, I failed to actually look up where their other hospital is, but they have a new hospital now in Mongo up in the northern part of Togo uh, somewhere. Um, so here's the, here's the route from Lome up to the, where the hospital is located. And you can see how that goes right along by the Ghana border. Um, at, at some points, you're, we're just down there at the bottom. We're just a, mile, a couple miles from Ghana. Um, and uh, I, this picture shows you where Palame is. And I point that out just because... Um, when we talk about Melissa growing up in Togo, she grew up in Palame. Um, so that's, you can see where that is. It's just like 30 minutes or something like that from the, from the hospital. Um, so as you go along that kind of drive, uh, you know, there's very little industry or economy in that, uh, in that kind of level in Togo. And so you see micro enterprise everywhere. In other words, people making money however they can make it. So like this lady at this, it was a huge fruit stand um, where she's selling plantains and uh, mangoes and whatever else those things are. Um, so uh, when you're almost to the hospital, the hospital's way over there on the left side, and um, when you're almost there, you come into what's here on the right side, which is this, this town of Adeta, which is a pretty good-sized town. And then from there, you drive over through the little village of Chica, and then this doesn't show the right route. You go up that road and into the hospital up there. So it's about, oh, 10 minutes from Adeta out to where the hospital is. Um, so here we, here we zoom in, and you can see some of that, that little village of Chica over on the right, and then the road uh, that goes to where the entrance to the hospital is, and you can, um, uh, you see that, what do you notice at the bottom of that picture? Yep, they got an airstrip, and they're actually their regional their regional director for their mission board in Africa is based there and is a pilot. So if we zoom in, then it's kind of funny to me because the compound is kind of shaped like Togo. <laughs> uh, uh, this this shows you not not these parts; these are other people's homes. There's there's a wall along here, but that's the hospital compound, that long and and skinny uh, thing right there. Um, and so you've got the kind of the, the long drive at the front entrance and then the hospital itself. And then right up in the front is the area where the patient's families will stay and where they're constructing new housing for families. I'll show you that later. And then right by the hospital is the outpatient clinic, the little building for their nursing school. Then there's a whole bunch of buildings that are maintenance, print shop, generator, stuff like that. And then this whole back part of the compound is mostly various types of housing for short and long-term missionaries, um, as well as their school building. So what I want to do now is just kind of take you through those areas one at a time. Um, and again, we'll show you some more things next week at 930, but, uh, um, and we'll talk more then about some of the lessons we can learn. So I want to start back here on this back part of the compound um, and I want to just kind of show us the people, the, show us the candles first of all, and uh, remind us who our partners are. So, wait a second, that's not the candles. That's, that's the candles pet monkey. Eric, what's, what's her name? Cosette. Yes, but I guess if we're partners with her too, if we're partners with her family, right? So, you now support Cosette. You make sure she has food and, uh, to keep her going. She's a 
cute, friendly, vicious little thing. <laughs> I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that. Okay, here's, here, here's, the, here's what we meant to show you. Uh, here they are. So Tom and Melissa, and then Peyton, Avery, Taylor, Christian, Celeste, Eden. Okay, you got it? From oldest to youngest, it's Peyton, Avery, Taylor, Christian, Celeste, Eden. You want to review that one more time? Peyton, Avery, Taylor, Christian, Celeste, Eden. You got it? Peyton, Avery, Taylor, Christian, Celeste, Eden, and Cosette the monkey. All right. So here's their home. Uh, it is, it's cool how it's just really centrally located among all those other homes and things because they really are like a hub for all the missionaries and short-termers and all that. Um, so there's Melissa in her kitchen. Um, and you might recognize a couple things here on the front. We've got uh, three, six, nine, ten jars of peanut butter, a big stack of bacon, Bags full of Chick-fil-A sauce. Some of you, some of you were the source of those gifts that we sent over for them. Uh, so just a few pictures. This is a new little addition that they just got built onto their house, so they're really excited about that. So hanging out with the kids, trying to stay awake with jet lag. Um, some more pictures of their house now and playing games together and risk and uh, they had a couple African ladies cook an African meal for us so this is getting ready for that um, you know they didn't push us to do anything crazy but in general I would just say that the food there um, isn't as challenging as some other areas in the world um, because they're so economically simple they don't have you know the ability to get lots of fancy things so it's a very kind of simply based diet so if food is a fear for you in missions, um, it's, it's not really scary. This whole meal was, was super easy to eat. I mean, they knew they were cooking for Americans, but they were still cooking African food for us. And I would tell you what these things are, but I don't remember. <laughs> there's some plantains up there, and there's another vegetable, and then there's this kind of sweet but also hot sauce, stew kind of stuff, and then rice, and it was good. Um, here they are opening some of the other gifts that you all sent for them. It was kind of like Christmas, early Christmas uh, for them. Um, here's another view of their house. Uh, so you can kind of see the jungle hills up behind the compound, and you can, you can drive up into those hills. And uh, from up in the hills, you can look down uh, on the compound um, let's see, do I have a laser pointer or something? There we go. You see my laser pointer a little bit? This is the hospital building right here um, from, uh, from up above. Um, so, and here's another view kind of the hills back up behind it. And this is Pastor Eric and Brandon also hiked up past some little villages in those hills. We're going to show that to you next week. Um, there's another view just kind of out of the hospital wall up to the hills behind it. Um, this is actually the view from the Kendall's front porch. Um, now, I should point out that uh, they have two seasons in Togo. There's the wet season when it's just rain, almost seems like all the time. And then they have the dry season, which you guys can understand well, because you know about Santa Ana's. They have Hamartan? Is that the word? That come down from the Sahara. Uh, and so half the year they're just completely dried out and half the year they're sopping. And um, so we were there at the perfect time, right on the shoulder between the two, where it wasn't raining on us, but it was still green. But they kept saying to us, this won't be green next week, this won't be green next week. So uh, I don't want you to mis misperceive that. Do you guys have enough seats back there? Do we have an usher who can help us find uh, seats for our guests in the back? Not guests, but we're treating you like guests in the back row. Um, 
Let's see. All right, just a couple more pictures of the people. Here are the men uh, just before we left. And then here's uh, Dr. Kendall and Melissa with her parents. So this is Ron and Ann Washer. And so one of the things the Lord worked out was for them to be there when we were there, which was really special. Um, so they were missionaries in this area of Togo. Remember I showed you Palame? They lived in Palame. And um, uh, he is now the, Ron is now the director for their mission board for all of Africa. Um, and it's not just Melissa's parents, it's her grandparents who pioneered the ministry in this area of Togo. So again, it's uh, Melissa's grandmother that wrote this book that uh, we want to encourage all of you to read. Um, and I'll step away from the hospital compound for a minute. We don't have a great picture of it, but down in Palame, we, met, we went and visited the blind school, which is one of the most visibly remarkable things that, uh, I didn't mean the pun there, um, that Melissa's grandmother did. Um, she was, uh, her, her ingenuity in her work with the blind was incredible. And the government recognized that, and they ended up with a really remarkable campus. You can just see one of the buildings in the background, a couple of the kids over there, but they have a uh, really remarkable school for the blind there um, that continues on after her grandmother started it I, I, in the early 80s, I believe. Um, at that, that same place, you can see the, the grave of her grandfather, Dallas Washer, uh, who was a evangelistic missionary, very much loved by the Togolese people. So you can read all about that in Melissa's grandmother's book. Uh, just a couple more pictures of people. Brandon trying to break somebody's back. Uh, uh, there's Eden being cute. Uh, Avery being a ham. And Celeste down there. And uh, Brandon embarrassing his mother. Uh, Grandpa helped put up a big swing on one of the trees. So, um, so we're still back here on the back side of the hospital property. And as you... As you move around that back part, it really is beautiful. You know, it wouldn't, again, it wouldn't stay this green, but these trees that look like those on the left, you'll see them in a lot of my pictures. Those are teak trees that the missionaries planted decades ago because there's a lot of money to be made from selling those trees. Um, so all over the compound, there are groves of teak trees. And those things, I'll show you later, they drop huge leaves that probably scared me 15 times. <laughs> One of those things hits the ground around you and you just jump. Uh, between that and the lizards, I got, I got, I got, what? Yeah, they're, they're everywhere, yeah. Uh, so anyway, just a few pictures from the back of the compound. Um, there, there are several of these homes like this that are for long-term or short-term missionaries. That road goes back to the airstrip. Um, there's a, little schoolhouse for the missionary kids. The Kendalls were so, uh, if you've read their updates, you know they were so grateful for a family that came uh, in right after we, that the week after we were there, this family came to help with schooling their kids. And by the way, if you want a great look at what it's like to be a new missionary in Togo, you should friend those people on Facebook. Um, they have, since they got there in December, posted a wonderful series of, they just do a great job of summarizing what they're going through. And I just this morning I was reading, they posted a video of singing together with it at a, a revival service, a hymn that they knew, and so just their joy in sharing that together with Togolese Christians. And they posted a description of a whole bunch of the Togolese coworkers that they've gotten to know and the different things they mean to them. So, but they've also posted about, you know, bugs and snakes and food and language and all kinds of other things. So talk to me and I'll tell you who that is if you want to, we could let them know why these strange people in the U.S. are sending them friend requests, but it's, it's really helpful. Um, uh, I'm just going to pause and ask, anybody have any, anything you want to ask me right now before I um, keep plowing ahead, Tim? I don't remember. It, she talks about it in the book, but I don't I don't remember. Right. Right. 
Yes, Sander. Mm. I think they're flagpoles. Why don't they have leaves and stuff? I think they're flagpoles that don't have... Fl oh, are you talking about these? These little things down here? Or are you talking about these? Yeah, that's Those are flagpoles. Here's Andrew. This is just for you. This is a termite mound that is probably three times as tall as Xander. Uh, there are huge termite mounds. This is not the tallest of them. There's another one that's the tallest, but this is a big one that we walk by every day. Uh, there's some guest housing that we stayed in, and I failed to get a good picture of it, but there's Pastor Eric and Brandon on the porch of it. Um, and there's a, there's a room that they use for their uh, Sunday evening uh, services together with the missionaries. This is a... Um, here's Dr. Kendall getting ready to lead... Uh, when we were there, they just did that, um, like the last two hours. They just had that together uh, in Togo. Uh, there's me preaching to them um, and them fellowshipping together afterwards. This is a super important part of the week for the missionaries because they all go to Togolese church on Sunday morning. Um, but for many of them, that means you're not understanding very much of it at all because of the language barrier. So this is a chance to have a service in their own language. So doc one of Dr. Kendall's responsibilities is leading that each week. Um, but most of the week, that room is set up with tables because it's where we ate our meals. It's where the short-term missionaries eat their meals. Um, they have a couple African ladies that cook uh, pretty American food. And um, this picture is from the morning when Pastor Eric gave a devotional at their medical staff meeting. Um, there's Dr. Kendall in that room. And there we are playing some games with some of the missionaries uh, late at night. Um, uh, so back to the compound um, uh, uh, sorry, back to this. This building where that, that services are, where the meals are, it's kind of a hub for the missionaries. That's just right across the lawn from the Kendall's house. And Melissa does a lot to oversee the housing, the meals, the hospitality for all the short-term missionaries and teams. There's a basketball court right across the, right in front of the Kendall's house. On Sunday afternoons, they play street hockey with some of Peyton's Togolese friends. You might find Brandon there in that one. Um, you also can't really see it, but on the left side of this, there's a swimming pool also. Uh, so that's all on this back portion of the compound. But let's go back up to the front now where there's this kind of long driveway that comes down in. So this is looking out of that driveway as the people come in and all day long they come uh, streaming in on foot or by moto or sometimes a bike or a little taxi. And they come for one of two primary reasons. There are at least four clues to one of the reasons in that picture. Can you see them? Right. So one is to get water. Clean water is massively important in Africa. It's life or death. There's a wonderful story in the book of how the Lord provided abundant water for the hospital compound and the whole community uh, through it. So they come all day to get water. I took this picture right after I watched this poor guy crash on his moto. He, he's got four of these water things on there, and there's just a little hill right back here that he had to get up, and he tried to go up it with his motorcycle and tipped over and had to stop and untie all that and get it all back, tied back on, and then continue on his way. Life in Africa is extremely inefficient. That's one of the first things they warn Americans about when we go. Um, can you imagine if you had to go through that kind of routine just to get your day's water for your family? Um, but if they aren't coming for water, then people are probably coming down the driveway to get to the clinic, which is right there at the front at the end of the driveway. Uh, here's the clinic from a, kind of a front angle, what you'd see as you come in. Here it is from the side. Now, this is on the weekend when it's closed. That's why you don't see people around. Most of the time, there are people all around. Here's the front entrance to it. And um, if you happen to know French, you can uh, see the days of the week, that when they're open, the hours when they accept patients. You can see there's a section there for prenatal appointments and hours for vaccinations and 
So basically, uh, each if you're if you're familiar with like what the you know some in our some of the nurses in our church have gone on medical missions outreach trips where they've set up like temporary clinics. That's what this is. It's just year round, um, uh, and they re- every day they see. I think they see the t- maximum number of patients they can see, and then they just start turning people away. I think. I don't remember what the number is, but they've got a certain number in the hundreds that somewhere between 100 and 200 that they can see in a day. And so um, uh, the clinic sees about 16,000 patients a year. So we think of the hospital as the heart of what's going on there, but in terms of number of people, the clinic is, you know, has 10 times as many people as the hospital just because of bed limitations in the hospital. Um, then adjacent to the clinic, so the clinic's on the left, on the right is another building that where they have some exam rooms and other things that they can use. And that building's also where there's this room where, that we might use if we do something dental in the future. This is the current extent of their dental services, a very old and unused dental chair. Um, so, so all day long, the patients stream in. Most often, they come on their, on their motos, but... Um, they walk to, if I remember right, about 40% of them are Muslims. Um, someone with a little bit more money might pay for a taxi. I'm not sure if that's what that car is over there, but that may be what it is. Um, so during the day, it's just buzzing with people. Uh, this is the main lobby of the clinic. And so it's there in that lobby that um, each morning the patients hear a gospel message preached by one of the Togolese hospital chaplains. You see him over there in front of the wall of patient records? Uh, HIPAA's a little bit different over there. Uh, I think there are about 80 people packed in that waiting room while he preaches the gospel to them. And then after that, what do they do? What do we do in American healthcare? Guess. They wait. <laughs> Right? And so they wait and wait and wait uh, while everybody gets taken care of. So that's the clinic. Uh, We're still up at the front of the property, right at the end of that long driveway. Any questions about that? Yes? Um, Yeah, they have literature to give them. Um, I think it would primarily be in French. There are two languages going on there all the time, so I'm never real sure what they're speaking. Um, There's a, in the south portion of Togo and into Ghana a little bit and into Benin a little bit, Eve is the primary tribal language. So Eve and French are the two languages there, and I would think he's speaking in French, but I'm not positive, because, because people come to the clinic from all over the place, so I don't think the tribal language would be what they'd be using. Um, but then next Sunday, we're going to show you some really cool things from their print shop. They have a really remarkable printing ministry to make sure that the hospital and the churches have plenty of materials, tracts and lessons and Bibles and things for the people. Yep. Tim. Do people um, try to pay something for the services? Oh, yeah, they do. Absolutely. They're, they're, they're paying. Um, everybody's paying pretty much except for... I don't, I don't understand all the details of that, but my guess would be that just like in America, except for emergency stuff that you're required, you know, the services they're required to give or whatever, um, everybody's paying. And they just had to raise their rates a little bit, actually. Um, there's just no possible way to have financial sustainability there without it. And they don't want, they don't want the... It's not dignifying for the patients to not be paying either, so it's part of treating them like people. Yeah, so they pay. Okay, uh, so now we, so we showed you the hospital and the clinic, which are, you, you see the little hospital symbol there? It's in the dark. Um, now we're up above that, so we're up in the very front corner of the property, and um, this is the, um, when a patient is in the hospital, their family is responsible to feed them. So you've got to have families stay there to take care of you if you're going to be in the hospital. So right up here in the front corner of the property is this another grove of teak trees. Um, 
and a building, the building back in the back that they call the cuisine, which is where families can cook their meals um, for their patients, their family members who are patients. And then they can just kind of generally hang out here during the days when they wait. You can see that's an extremely primitive uh, setting there. There's a little bathhouse nearby that for families to use. There are lines for them to hang out. They're very colorful laundry. Um, this shows us, this is looking across the back of the hospital down to where those little bathhouses are. Um, so what do we have in the foreground? Yeah, we've got permats for those Muslim patients and, and family members that come. So now if I go back to this map here, you see the, uh, where's my laser pointer? You see this big grove of trees right there? That's gone now because one of the most, at least visibly exciting projects going on at the hospital right now is this. They are constructing five of these buildings to replace that little old cuisine. So this is where families can stay and cook meals and hang out during the days when they wait for their family members. Um, so it, they're very, very simple concrete and block rooms um, that each family will be able to use. But this is a huge upgrade from this current cuisine building that they're using. So that's a big construction project they're working on that's, that's really uh, going to be a huge service to those patient families. Okay, a few more pictures of things around the property. I, I, I don't know how to get you to capture the size of those leaves, but they're massive. Uh, lizards, lizards everywhere. Um, this picture is actually out of the front entrance of the hospital across the street. So just showing you one of that little houses in that village of Chica. Uh, this is their chapel. I think that Jonathan Osborne has been helping some CD, CBU students work on engineering for a new chapel to replace this one. So like in the morning, they would have like staff devotions in here. Um, shipping containers are super important for bringing belongings for missionaries and supplies for the hospital. And then those containers are often turned into buildings, sometimes on their own like this one, or sometimes a whole bunch of them together. So this is like maintenance and storage buildings, but you can see it's constructed out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine shipping containers uh, put together and then walls built up around them. So um, here's the generator building since, you know, electricity can just go off on them anytime and they've got to be ready to kick in with their own, own power. So, all right, let's get to the hospital itself, uh, which is in the front right by the clinic. And kind of strangely, I didn't get a good picture of the front of the hospital. You can tell it's kind of down a hill and uh, uh, not that noticeable, uh, but this is the front, and uh, Tim, there's the cashier over there on the left. Um, so they go from the clinic down to the cashier to pay and then get their uh, whatever services they're getting. Um, this is the end of the hospital near the clinic. Um, that's, actually, that's actually the ICU end of the hospital. Um, and then this is a couple different views of the back. Uh, so it's a for a hospital, it's a pretty little single-story building, but that maybe gives you a little bit of a sense of the size. Uh, here's the central nursing station with Dr. Kendall and some of their Togolese staff. So I think there are about 160 Togolese employees, um, including all the way up to nurses and anesthetists. They don't have Togolese doctors or surgeons right now, but um, almost all of their nurses and anesthetists. So um, and I, don't, I didn't show you a picture of it, but they have a, a little building that they use for their nursing school. So one of the really neat things the Lord has established there, there is a missionary lady who comes four years at a time, and each time she's there for four years, she trains a cohort of Togolese nurses. And then she comes back to the States for a year of furlough, and then she comes back, and she's there four years and trains a cohort of Togolese uh, nurses. So... Um, in the early days of the hospital, they had too many doctors, missionary doctors, and way too few nurses. Now they have lots of nurses and a huge need for doctors and, and surgeons. So that's really, it's part of the ministry is having Togolese nurses that are 
able to, you know, do spiritual ministry with the patients as well. So when you picture the ministry there, just don't picture missionaries doing all of the ministry of the Word. Picture a whole team of Togolese workers doing the ministry of the Word. Not that they're all Christians or genuine Christians, but Scott. Huh. Was that on the front entrance of the hospital there? And is that a Canadian flag? And then a Togolese flag? I'd, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I don't think it would offend them. Yeah. Chris. Oops, sorry. Uh-huh. Right, it's a well. Mm-hmm. Right. They actually were running out of, I think there was a, you'll have to read the story in the book, but there was a U.S. drilling team that was in Togo, and they were running out of, they were down to their last couple of drills that they had money to pay for, and they kept coming up empty, and they took the a map of the compound, and they laid out where all the termite mounds were, and they figured out where the center of all the termite mounds were, and drilled there and found this water that supplied the hospital for for the 35 years since then in the whole community. So, Well, that's what they told us, but the book doesn't say it. She says it was somebody else's idea. Yeah, in the book. Um, or maybe she's just being humble. I do remember being a little different than what they said. Yeah, maybe she was just being humble. Um, I, just another example of a Togolese employee. I don't have a lot of these pictures, but this is their HR director, Um, employee relations are very, very difficult when you're crossing cultures. That's a huge challenge for them. I don't have very many pictures or very good pictures of all the rooms inside the hospital, partly because you're just trying to be sensitive to patient privacy and everything just kind of open. This is the pediatric room, you can tell. Um, There's also a room for women, a room for men, and an ICU. Tim? Yes, Chloe? Chloe? Hmm. You remember those great big mounds that we saw earlier? Remember what lives in those great big mounds? You know what termites do to wood? They eat it. It's their meal. So they can't really build stuff out of wood. They use it sometimes in like ceilings and stuff like that, but they can't build building structures out of wood. They'll just get rotted away and eaten away. Great question, Chloe. Scott? Yes. Right, right. But you, right. So they use that. They were, they, we'll show you next week part of what we're, what, next Sunday, what, part of what we want to show you is just all the different kinds of skills that the Lord's using there so that we can encourage all of you to go to Togo. Um, and we'll show you their, uh, their woodworking shop. And so they were taking some of those hardwoods and doing their own molding and stuff while we were there. So yeah, you just can't build a whole building with teak. That would cost a fortune, you know. Lorraine. Did we see a cat the whole time we were there? All right, all right, here we go. So uh, there's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if, Lorraine, I don't know if you heard what he said, but we're quite sure the cats all get eaten. Okay, all right. Here's patient waiting in the hallway and family with them. Billy Rubin light on a baby. There's a little guy. Um, so for Dr. Kendall, there are two aspects of the hospital, hospital ministry that are especially central. One is the administration. He's the director of the hospital. Here he is. That's Dr. Michael Gale. He's another long-term missionary doctor there. He's the medical director. 
Um, but Dr. Kendall is the overall administrator. So this might not be the most exciting picture I show you, but it's very important because we have to try to imagine the kind of responsibility that comes with running a hospital and clinic of this magnitude. Um, that's a responsibility that Dr. Kendall has had placed upon him in this last couple of years. And so all of those patients, close to 20,000 patients, the, all the missionaries, 160 employees, as well as the physical plant itself, that's all ultimately his responsibility. And so this is one of the reasons why it's so important for them to have a sending church here in the U.S. that is lifting them up in every way possible. The other aspect that's especially important to Dr. Kendall is carried out in the two operating rooms. You can tell um, that, you know, they're doing what they can do. We have the operating room numbers written in chalk on the doors. So here's room number one, and here's uh, Dr. Kendall. Well, you know, here we are. I mean, you can't see us in the picture. We're not on the table, thankfully. But you can tell we're in the room. Here we are in the room observing a surgery. Here's Dr. Kendall consulting um, on a surgery, and one of their uh, big plans and prayers right now is to be able to begin preparing African surgeons. Um, and so right now, all of the surgery load has to be carried by missionaries, either long-term missionaries like the Snooks are hoping to be, or short-term missionaries like everybody else in this picture except Dr. Kendall. Those are all short-term surgeons who come for a few days or, or weeks or months um, so yeah, here's a young surgeon who is, not a great picture, but that's a young surgeon who was there for a few months. Tom's really been enjoying working with him. Uh, you can't really see his wife. She's over there. She's right, she's right here, but she's a doctor too. Um, and so she was there helping, or she had a nurse. No, she was a doctor, right? He's a doctor. Uh, so they were there with their little kids, both trying to serve. And then um, this just shows you other short-term missionary surgeons who were there when we were there. Um, the lady in the back with a towel on her head, she's an Australian doctor who was there short-term, but the other three are, are all surgeons. Um, and so there's just, there's a tremendous need for everything at the hospital, from surgeons and doctors to grounds and maintenance to teachers and accountants and administrators. They just need every kind of help. Um, I asked, uh, this is... Dr. Sam Williams, and they, he and his wife have been coming like a month at a time for, oh, like 25 years or something. And I asked him, what, you know, I asked him, what, change, what, you, what have you seen change and what stays the same? And he says, what stays the same is that there's never close to enough help in just about every area. Um, but as, port, as important as administration and surgeries may be, I said those are the two things that are the main big responsibilities for Dr. Kendall. It's the spir spiritual healing, of course, that is most important. I remember the first time I was walking the property and came around the corner and there was the morgue. Um, and it was kind of a startling reminder that the physical healing is only temporary. And so throughout the hospital, you'll see very boldly and clearly displayed the Word of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved in your family. So this is one of the best pictures from the whole trip. Here Dr. Kendall is showing how each patient has not only a medical chart, but a spiritual chart. So each of these lines on this chart here is a chaplain visit. Now the chaplains are all Togolese, not American missionaries. These are all chaplain visits and notes about their conversations with that patient. So each patient has both kinds of, of chart. Here on the wall in the operating room is the plan of salvation through six verses. As you can see, it could use a little maintenance if they had personnel to help. So if any of you would be able to go to Togo and hang those back up on the wall, they'd appreciate it. Um, but here is a... So now we're just looking through the door of operating room two, but here you have a Togolese uh, anesthetist right here. So he's monitoring the patient while he has local anesthesia. So the patient's right here, he's awake, and this anesthetist is sharing the gospel with him while he's laying there having uh, surgery performed on him. And as he, you can't see it from here, but the way he's turning his head, those verses are right up there on the wall um, beside, the, beside the patient. So 
If you ask Dr. Kendall what matters most, it's not the administration of the surgeries, it's the gospel. And one of the reasons why we're involved in this partnership is because it's not just about the gospel, but also about seeing healthy churches developed and pastors trained and mentored. Um, Tom feels the burden for all of that, and that's part of why we're involved. Um, I, so this is you know out of time and order, but I, I, this is actually down at the Blind School campus in Palame, but we were able to see just the very end of a, you know, a class, kind of like a seminary kind of a class for pastors that they were holding. These guys had just finished a week of, of classes. Um, so they're continuing to try to develop Togolese pastors, but there's a big need for missionaries to help mentor those pastors. And so what, I, what I'm trying to express here is that this hospital is not just and, and clinic, it's not just overseas health care done by Christians. We wouldn't have this kind of partnership if that was all that it was. It's overseas health care done partly by Christians as a center for gospel outreach and a hub for a whole bunch of local churches. And these pastors are a reminder of that. And part of the burden that just weighs on Tom is the burden of those churches, struggling churches, struggling pastors, while he's trying to carry out hospital administration and keep up with all the surgeries and all the employees and all those things. So I, I hope this is starting to give you a little bit of a feel for the scope of what God has put together th- there. This is a uh, kind of like a bulletin board, a chalkboard in, the, in that room where we had our meals and there are different prayer cards for different missionaries that are part of the team. But then you also see the dots on there. Those, each of those, here's the hospital right here on the map. And so you can see there's a big cluster of uh, churches. Those dots represent churches that have been planted through that ministry. You can see there's a big cluster of them in that region. And then up here is their other hospital, and a little cluster of churches up there. Um, so you can hopefully sense the kind of responsibility that Tom and Melissa and their family have. Um, next Sunday, I'll come back and explain more about what some of these things mean First of all, in terms of some of the lessons we learned and what these things meant for our hearts and our relationship with God, and then secondly, what our role our church will have in the future. Um, And then in the next service this morning, I'm going to be preaching and also showing you some more pictures, and we'll have some more more things to show you next week. But uh, that gives you the factual overview. I'm tired. Uh, uh, So we're, it's 1022, so we're out of time, but We'd love to have you ask us questions anytime as we go along with these things. And uh, don't forget my reminders to start saving for yourself to be able to go, Lord willing. And we have these six copies of Melissa's grandmother's book that we'd love for you to borrow and and read. So come grab one of these um, if you would like to do that. All right, you're dismissed. We'll see you back here in a few minutes.